Welcome to the Writer's Voice Cafe. I'm Diane Hamilton, and I will be your host tonight. Thank you so much for coming. We have Matt on the camera. Thank you, Matt, and thank you to the women at PTV. Cell phones are off, please. Okay? So, we are proud to present for our November Writer's Voice Cafe, Kathleen O'Keefe Tanovis. She will be reading and talking about her book. Beautiful cover. Gorgeous cover. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that too. Surviving Cancer Land, Intuitive Aspects of Healing. And that's that, that um, line underneath the title is very, very important. Um, in this book, she suggests that we use conventional methods as well as alternative and intuitive guidance. And the book has a spiritual aspect to it as well as practical. Uh, it has a lot of gems to help us navigate through a health crisis, or I would say any crisis. Okay. Each chapter, and I'm just, I'm going to be finished in a minute. Each chapter leads with a relevant quote that's, that pertains to the chapter, an affirmation, and ends with survival keys. So it's memoir, self-help, it just, it's, it's really an exciting and empowering book. She reminds us that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And she reminds us that we all have spirit guides, guardian angels, uh, auras, uh, chakras, she really talks about all of these, and that we can hear messages, we can hear answers, we can hear if we tune into our dreams, our meditations, and our prayers. So I'm not going to say too much more. It's in four parts. Should I mention that? Sure. Um, do I have them? Yes. The first part is discover and how she went to discovering um, her cancer. Two is being. Three is evolving. And for it's coming full circle. Um, okay, so without further ado, Kathleen O'Keefe Cannabis. Yes. <laughs> Tonight, I'm so excited to be here with you. Yes, my book is Surviving Cancer Land, Intuitive Aspects of Healing, and I think I just sent you all a little handout. Um, the reason I named the book Surviving Cancer Land is while I was going through treatment for three breast cancers, I am a three-time breast cancer survivor, and every single time the doctors missed my cancer, they missed it, and I, I knew I had it because my dreams told me I had it. The spirit guides in my dreams said, you have breast cancer, you go back to your doctor. So what I found that while I was going through treatment, it was much like I was Alice in Wonderland. They would give me something, they'd give me a pill, they'd give me chemo, they'd give me shots, and then they just kind of step back and see what happened because they didn't really know themselves. You know, they, they are going on what I call the norm. For 70% of the people, this works or this happens. But the thing is, very few of us belong to the norm. We're all individuals. We all have different fingerprints. We all have different DNA. We all have different retina scans. We are not all the same. And so, in order to get through any crisis, we really need to connect with our inner guides. And our inner guides connect to us through dreams. We spend all this time praying, when we're, especially when we're in crisis. I, I know very few people, even if they, they say they don't believe in a higher power or they don't believe in God, you give them a really bad crisis where either their life or the life of their child is on the line, they're going to become a believer. <laughs> they're going to start praying. 
And they'll say to me, but I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And that's great. That's the first step. Did you listen for the answer? Well, how am I going to get the answer? In your dreams. I go, in my dreams? Your dreams are sacred doorways to where you were before you were born. And if your parents tell you that you just happened in the back seat of the floor, oh. no, you didn't. You were planned, and you planned to be here exactly when you got here. So, with my book, Surviving Cancer Land, I suddenly realized just how important our dreams are. Everyone dreams. Everybody in here dreams. If you don't remember your dreams, that's another story, but you dream. And some dreams save lives. Whether it's through health, whether it's through relationships. There are so many women I've spoken to who were in extremely abusive relationships that their life was in danger. They were getting recurrent nightmares. We are talking about nightmares a little bit earlier. Recurrent nightmares that were red flags telling them to get out of the relationship. But because they didn't believe them, it's just a dream, they almost lost their lives. So what is it that dreams really do? How does this work? Let me just tell you how it worked in my case. Because we're all individuals, and we all have different stories, and we all have different dreams. I went to my doctor for my yearly physical. You know, we all do that. You go and get your mammogram blood test or pap smear. Oh, it's just like so much fun. You get to get felt off by everybody. And, <laughs> and my doctor said, you're healthy. Go home. And that's when the nightmare started. I had a nightmare in which, and I don't know why, I've had monks, Franciscan monks, email me. I've had them come in on my radio show and say, why Franciscan monks? I had a Franciscan monk step into my dream to talk to me. So how did that happen? I was having what's known as an epic dream, that dream that you have when you first fall asleep at night. And sometimes when you wake up in the early in the morning, you think you're having the same dream again, but you're not. You have about five different dreams during the night. You bounce into a dream, down into a dream, you come back up. It's in and out of REM. Rapid eye movement all night long. And sometimes, and who knows why, because our minds are just so incredible, we'll have the dream that we had when we first fell asleep when we wake up, and we think we dreamed that whole dream all night long. We didn't. We had about five. Some people remember them all. Some people might remember three. But in my case, I was dreaming my epic dream and all of a sudden, it froze. It stopped. Just like somebody had flipped the, the, uh, the stop button on a recorder on the TV. A pause button. And a pop-up window happened in the dream. Just like a pop-up on your computer and just as hard to get rid of. And I'm looking at it in my dream going, what is that? And then all of a sudden, the pop-up window turns into a pop-up door. And this Franciscan monk steps through the door and into my dream. And I'm like, oh, now that's bizarre. I mean, I actually said, that, that's really weird. What, what is that? And it was a monk dressed in a brown robe with the hood, with the little rope belt and the little sandals. And I'm looking at him going, that's bizarre. And he goes, come with me. And I'm like, come with you? And he led me through the doorway. The door closed up. And I'm in a room with other monks. Now, I have no affiliation whatsoever with monks. I, none. And I'm looking at them, and the one monk came up to me and took my hand like this and said, I'll pass. Oh, you'll pass? I'll okay. Pass. Yeah. And said, Do you feel that? Said, in the dream, yeah. And the monk said, that's breast cancer. Get back to your doctor tomorrow without an appointment. So I woke up in the morning, and I said to my husband, 
and you go back to the doctor. And he said, why? And I said, I think I need an MRI or I need some other kind of test. So my husband drove me all the way back to the Dana Farber Cancer Institute. And I said to my doctor, I think I need another type of test. And he goes, Kathy, you are so healthy. You're so healthy. I mean, look at your blood test, look at your physical, look at everything. And so he said, we'll do another set of tests. He did another blood test, another mammogram, another physical. And he said, you know, we'll send you the results. Okay. I waited, the results came, you know, it comes in the mail, you get that little yellow, uh, that little yellow paper that's a copy that says you're healthy. So I said, oh, look at this, I'm healthy, I'm great. Came about a week later. That night I had the dream again. Wow. Same dream. Pop-up door. The monk comes through. I'm looking at him like, why? And the monk goes, come with me, we have something to tell you. So I step back through and the monk says again, you have breast cancer. Go back to your doctor and you need an MRI. Tell him you need an MRI. And all the other monks are in there. And then what happens is when I would step back through, they would kind of, you know, bring me back out and the door would disappear and my dream would start right up again, right where it stopped. Mm. Because I was in the realm between the dreaming and what's on the other side of the veil. And there is no time or space. There's only like right now. There's this big now, that big Zen that everybody's trying to get into. And they're going in there and they're doing yoga and they're doing meditation. You can get to it through your dreams. That's real easy. Um, so I go back to my doctor and I said, I need an MRI. And the doctor says, Kathy, you don't qualify for an MRI. Oh. You are so healthy, but we'll give you another, give me the same test again. Long story short, the third time the paperwork came saying I was healthy, my, um, I had the nightmare again. The recurrent nightmare, a recurrent nightmare tells you that something's wrong, you're not getting it, you're not doing the right thing, and the universe is not going to give up on you. It is going to keep hammering away because it doesn't want you to die or it doesn't want you to fail or it wants to keep you safe. You're not on the right path. This is the fork in the road. You take the wrong fork, you're not going to fulfill your destiny. So I step through the dream door again and as soon as I see the guide, I start crying in the dream. I said, I know why you're here. I don't know what to do. I've been to my doctor three other times and he's not listening to me. If there is something wrong with me, because nobody can feel anything, nobody's seeing anything, you need to help me. You need to do something. Because I don't know what else to do. So the guy looked at me and he reaches into his pocket. Oh, I didn't bring my little, oh yeah, I did, it's in here. He reaches into his pocket and he pulls out a feather just like this. <laughs> and he hands it to me. So I want you to imagine that this is a sword. He says, I want you to take this with you in your mind to the doctor. If you go back to the doctor tomorrow without an appointment, I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> and you want to tell him that you need exploratory surgery. <gasps> and you use this feather as though it's a sword to verbally fence against him when he comes up with all these arguments as to why he can't do that. So I take the feather and I wake up the next morning and I say to my poor husband, <laughs> we're going back mm -hmm. to the doctor. I need to go back to the doctor. I know something is wrong. So I show up at the doctor's office without an appointment. He takes one look at me and says, why are you back? I follow him back into his office and I said to him, I know something's wrong. I need for you to do exploratory surgery. Well, he looked like I had just set myself on fire or something. Mm -hmm. And he said, I can't do that, Kathy. It's against hospital policy. It's against my policy. You have to think about um, the ramifications. You have to think about things like uh, infection, problems from anesthesia, 
I can't just cut you open and explore you because you think there's something wrong with you. Now go home. You're healthy. And all of a sudden, I remember the feather. And I imagined taking the feather out. I imagined pointing it at him. <laughs> and I said, you need to help me. I don't know where else to go. I know something is wrong. And I'm not going to leave until you help me. And it was as if a vampire had walked into the room. There's no other way to explain it. And just waved his hand. And he goes, OK, I'll be right back. And he walks out. He makes an appointment. For, for a week later, it was, was it New Year's. The day after, the second day after New Year's, I was just going to have time to recover. The second day after New Year's, I was going in for surgery, exploratory surgery. And I remember thinking to myself, my God, what if he gets in there? What if I am crazy? How many people would go and fight with a doctor that tells you you're healthy and beg him to cut you open and see if there's something there? Maybe I'm totally insane. Being nuts, right? So the day of the surgery, I go in and people are filling out, you know, the, the nurses and they can say they all come. So you think you got a bump, huh? <laughs> uh -huh. You think there's something there, huh? Well, you know, we can't find anything, but 90% of the time there's nothing there. Nothing there. You don't, you don't have to worry. You're, you're fine. We, we just, you know, you'll be fine. Long story short, the pathology report showed I was in stage two with it in my lymph nodes. Wow. That sent the doctor into a swirl. He's like, it's not on anything. It's not on the mammograms. It's not on the blood test. It's not everything. And when I was in his office, when I pointed the feather at him, and he came back in and he said, OK, I've got you set up for an appointment, I said, um, who's going to do the surgery? He goes, why? Well, and I said, don't you think we should have an, uh, a, you know, a, a cancer doctor present? Somebody in oncology? He goes, you don't have cancer. You're not old enough for cancer. Mm. You're far too young for cancer. You don't have it. There, if there's anything in there, it's a fibristic tumor. We're just going to take it out, and that's going to be the end of it. OK? So now he's coming into my room where I'm recovering, and this is all in the book, <coughs> including the dreams of the monks. And he says, Pathology didn't like what they saw when they cut you open, when they when they cut the, the tumor open. See, what happened was while I was under anesthesia mm -hmm. in surgery, I heard him say, we got it off, close her up. And I dragged myself out of anesthesia, turned my head, looked at him and said, what was it? You could have heard a pin drop on, in there. All you saw were eyeballs. Look at mm -hmm. eyeballs looking at me like this. And this face comes up over the top of me and looks down at me, cuts off the light, which was great because it was so bright, and says, did she just speak? And my doctor said, yeah, give her more. And he said, cat, it's just what we thought it was. It was just a fibristic tumor, go back to sleep. And they gave me all this anesthesia, and it just knocked me out forever. Took hours to wake up, and when I did, the doctor came in and he pulled the curtain, the privacy curtain around behind him, and he said, pathology didn't like what they saw when they cut open the tumor. Mm -hmm. And I said, so was it cancer? And he said, yeah. He said, stage two. And now I'm going to have to refer you to a specialist. And I said, the oncologist I asked for? And he just kind of looked down and he said, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm going to go get your husband. So. The bottom line is pathology confirmed the dreams. That was the validation. Pathology proved that the dream was right and the tests that they were using were wrong. So OK, I've had people say, OK, OK, so you were lucky. You were lucky. You know, that can happen. You have a dream. OK, you were lucky. Five years later, almost to the day, it's in the end of the book, to go in through the treatment, and using my dreams throughout the time I was in treatment, and they're all in here, to kind of argue with the doctors about the chemo I was going to take. Because they wanted me to take a second one, and I said, no. And they said, well, why not? And I said, well, I, don't, I, I know it's not going to work. How do you know it's not going to work? I said, I just do. Because if I had told my doctors 
even the first one. Look, I'm having a dream that I have cancer, and I've got these monks coming in, and they gave me a feather to verbally fence with you, and I want you to cut me open and see if they're right. I would have gotten a padded cell. That's what I would have gotten or medicine to stop the dreams. I would not have gotten the treatment. And I knew that. Because I asked the, the guides, I said, should I tell them about you? And they laughed. So that kind of meant no to me. Um, so I didn't say anything. Five years later, the doctors are still using mammograms to check for recurrence. And I said to them, why are you using a mammogram to check for recurrence when it, it didn't show cancer the first time and the doctor said to me were you were having your mammogram done the Faulkner was not the best place we're better and so mammograms are only as good as the people who take them and the people who read them and we're the best that was the bottom line right so just about the time I hit my five mark period and you know as a as a you can come in uh, at the five mark period Come on in, have a seat. Um, that's a big, big deal. When you hit that five mark period, it's like you're practically home free. And, and you're so excited, you want to throw a party. So I went in for my mammogram, and the radiologist is sitting right in there watching and looking at the mammograms in front of me. And he goes, Mrs. Cannabis, congratulations. You're healthy, go home. Now, because I had been working with my guides, that voice came right into my ear and said, no, it's not. You tell them to look right over there. And I knew where there was because I, we were that close. So I said to the doctor, what if, what's this over here? And he goes, Mrs. Cannabis, that's not, that's, that's not the breast that you had the cancer in. It was the other one. I said, yeah, but what about right here? And he goes, he turned to me in his chair. And he goes, you're healthy. Go home. Mm -hmm. And kind of dismissed me. So I ran downstairs to L2, lower level two, into radiology, to the chief of radiology, and I said, I need an MRI. Oh. He goes, you're healthy. I just talked to Dr. Gupta upstairs. We think you're having an anxiety attack. Mm -hmm. You don't qualify for an MRI. Go home. So I did, and that night, I had one heck of a nightmare. I call it the scary clowns. In this nightmare, the door opens, the guides go, come with me. So I, I've learned now, you just go. I walk, step through the door, and there is a female monk. I didn't even know there were female Franciscan monks. Does anybody in here know that, that they're a female? I didn't know that. I'm looking at her going, a female monk? It wasn't until I was doing my radio show one night when one of them called in and said, why do you have male Franciscan monks? And I, she goes, I'm a female Franciscan monk. I'm in Idlewild. I said, you're kidding. There are female monks? She goes, yeah, I'm one. And I'm like, gosh, OK, well, I kind of saw you. Um, so anyhow, she's holding my mammograms in her hand, the mammography film. Mm -hmm. But she, on top of her monk robe is a white doctor's coat. And she's got a stethoscope around her neck and a little white hat on, like a nurse's hat. And I'm looking at her going, now that's bizarre. <laughs> and the other two monks standing over there each have on white doctor's coats. And I'm going, yeah, that's just not normal either. And so the female monk motions to me like this, points. So I moved closer and I looked, and my name is written on the bottom in big, bold, black letters, Kathleen. O'Keefe Cannabis. And all of a sudden, boom, she turns into a giant, scary clown with big red curly hair and a big red bulbous nose and these big shoes. And she's rocking back and forth, laughing. And I turn to the other guys to help me, and they're all clowns too. And they're all laughing. And I go, oh my God, I got it. I got it. Wake up. This is a nightmare. And I woke myself up. And I said to my poor husband the next morning, we're going back to the doctor. And he goes, why? And I said, because I had a nightmare. I had another nightmare. So 
end of the book, I'm in the Dan and Farmer, down in L2, lower level radiology, and I go up to the desk and I said, I want you to make me an appointment for an MRI. The secretary goes, you can't do that. I said, call the doctor. I want an MRI. Wait until I get it. She pushes a button, the doctor walks through. He's chief of radiology, little tiny guy, big, big ego. And he says, um, Kathy, you don't qualify for an MRI. You're healthy, go home. And I said, I'm not going home, I want an MRI. I'm not leaving without it. Now I'm in his waiting room that's packed full of people. And uh, he goes, we didn't give you the last one, which was like two, three, three or four years ago. We didn't give you the last one. So we can't write up the next one. He goes, go, uh, he says, if you find out who gave you the last one, you can go to them. And he walks back through the doors. The secretary goes, no, go, go to your other doctors. So I went all the way up to the ninth floor to the chief of oncological surgery. And his secretary goes, we didn't give you the last one. Go find the doctor that did. So I went down to the fourth floor where I went to oncology, where I was infused, the chief of oncology. And he goes, no, yeah, we didn't give it to you. Go, go back down to L2 and find out who did it. So I go down to L2 to the chief of radiology. And I said, I don't know who gave me the last one. It's in my records. You look it up and you tell me who it is. And then you make me an appointment. She goes, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. And I said, you do that and you do it now, Let, right now. So I'm getting louder and louder. She must, must have pressed the emergency button. <laughs> the doctor comes in and he goes, what's the problem, Kathy? So I told him again. And he goes, we didn't give you the last one. I said, I don't care who gave me the last one. You are my doctor. Make this one. And he goes, we can't. I said, listen, if you don't make me that appointment right now, I'm going to lie down here on your floor. I'm going to kick my feet like a two-year-old who's had candy taken away. I'm going to scream and yell. You're going to have to call security to come in and drag me out by my heels. And I'm going to be on my, cell, on my cell phone to Channel 2 News as I'm going out the front door. He looked at me and he turned to his secretary and said, get her the appointment. And he left. Now, what's important about that is this. He could have always given it to me. It's not against hospital policy, or even then he wouldn't have been able to do it. But if you don't stand in your power and speak your truth, and basically fly in there on a broom if you need to, you're not going to get what you need. And as I write in this book, if that happens, if that happens, and you die, your doctor's going to mourn you for a while. And then life's going to go on as it always did, he's going to get another patient, and you're going to be forgotten. So if you want to be alive and be remembered, you have to stand in that power. And it's not just for cancer. It's not just for breast cancer. It's for any cancer, any illness, any crisis. Are you in a relationship that is making you ill? Are you in a job that's making you ill? Is all that coming through in your dreams? How would you know if you're not keeping a journal to read those dreams? How would you know if you're not able to access that message? So anyhow, the, the long story short is I get the MRI, but it takes me three and a half months to get it because they keep canceling it and putting somebody else in who's who's in crisis, right? So when I finally get it at three and a half months, I'm in stage four terminal. Oh, God. Nine by 11 centimeter. That sends the doctors, A, running for the hills, and B, all my records disappear. Oh. But it doesn't matter, because I made copies. Oh. <laughs> I even had the mammograms. I had it all. And there's a reason that that was so important. My guides kept telling me, keep records. Keep records. Write your dreams down. Keep oh. records. Make copies of the records. Get the originals if they won't give you the copies. And I did. So one of the reasons why that was so important is I ended up going through chemotherapy again. And the doctors kept saying, we're not going to do a double mastectomy. The, my guides told me, you need a double mastectomy. 
And I remember, I remember when I had been diagnosed a second time, when, when it turned out I did have the, the, the breast cancer. I was so devastated. Not only that, I was madder than hell at my guides. I was really mad at them. So this one night when I fell asleep and my guides came in, and I said to them, why me? Why twice? What have I ever done that was so bad that I should be punished like this? And they were just standing there looking at me, and I said, answer me. Tell me. And, 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 and you, and this is the other thing I said. I said, I know I'm dying. I'm in stage four, nine by 11 centimeter tumor. You may want to go warn God that I'm on my way, because I have some really big bones to pick with him when I get up there. <laughs> and they started laughing, and they said, Kathy, don't you remember? I said, remember what? They said, you said that you wanted to come down during a time when our higher powers were being taken out of everything. When science was being worshipped as a god rather than a gift from God. And you are going to prove that there's nothing higher than the higher power. And that science goes so far and then comes your higher power. And we told you before you were even born that we were going to be with you every step of the way. And we have been. And we're not going to stop now. You said you were going to do this. And that's when I realized despite being stage 4 9 by 11 centimeter tumor with the same cancer that Elizabeth Edwards had and died at stage two, I was going to live. I was going to live to have to show everybody that we have a purpose. And if we listen to those spirit guides in our dreams, we can overcome anything. We will not die till it's our moment. And we won't have that moment till we, we have fulfilled our destiny. And so that was a big turning point for me. That was where I embraced death as a friend, realizing we all have to die at some point. Nobody's going to live forever. And death is not the enemy. Death is the friend. And when I surrendered like that, that's when I really began to live. And I got well. And actually, I ended up going to New York to find people who would work with me without fighting me. And when they got my records, they called up the Boston doctors and said, what is wrong with you? Are you kidding me? And these were doctors that were every bit as big as the Boston doctors, if not bigger. So when I finished writing my book, Surviving Cancer Land, Intuitive Aspects of Healing, I was suddenly contacted by a doctor, a radiologist out of Duke University, a Dr. Larry Burke. Dr. Larry Burke had just received a grant to study women who had diagnostic dreams mm -hmm. that diagnosed breast cancer before it was ever found on any medical information. And I was the only one, he, had eight, he could only find 18 women that would agree to be in the study or would even talk to him. And I was the only one that had gone through it three times. And so I said, sure, I'll help you. What do you want me to do? Well, as it turns out, his study just got published in Medical Journal. And um, he was just in the Huffington Post. And we are now doing a book together. And we're collecting stories from women, men, anyone who has had any illness where they had a diagnostic dream. Because we want to get out to the world that dreams are a gift from our higher power. They're sacred doorways to universal wisdom that can go into the future and give you information that can be validated at some point so that you can say, yeah, I trust you. It's sort of like our spirit guides are like our parents. If any of you are parents in here, you tell your kids, you know, do this, and it's going to be much easier. If you do this, it's going to be easier. But as children, we ignore them, right? So eventually, they stop telling us what to do. They let us fall down. 
they let us break our noses, they let us do all the stuff that we end up doing until finally we start listening. By listening to your spirit guides in your dreams, it's like when your parents say, do this, you'll be better for it, and you do it, you've rewarded them, and now your parents look at each other and go, oh my gosh, she actually did what we asked her to do, and you've rewarded them. They start speaking to you more. It's the same thing with your dreams. Now for those of you who, how many of you in here have dream journals? Oh good, 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 we've got two, okay. Do you write your dreams down every night? Great, do you know the seven types of dreams? Do you, do you know the five ways to remember them if you forget your dreams? If you go to my website, accessyourinnerguide.com, or if you just Google me, Kathleen O'Keefe Cannabis, I've got pages and pages, so you'll just get there. Accessyourinnerguide.com, there's a free download for all of you in here today. It'll be up for about a week. And what it is, is it's a dream journal that you download on your computer, and it's also got the seven types of dreams, so you can start recognizing what kind of dream you have. Did you have an epic dream? Did you have a recurrent dream? Did you have a nightmare that was really a blessing in disguise? Um, you know, did you have a lucid dream? All the seven dreams are there, and they'll help you recognize what type of a dream you have. And it's gonna give you the five ways to remember your dreams. If you wake up in the morning and go, Dawn, I know I had a really good dream, but I can't remember what it is. This is going to help you get slide right back into that dream so you can write it down. Okay? So, do any of you have any questions? Questions about anything? Yeah. So, how far back was your uh, witness time as a child? Do you remember your dreams? Actually, that's a great question. When I was a child, I had an invisible friend named Gigi. <laughs> And Gigi kept me out of all kinds of trouble. And um, my parents used to say, that's fine. Don't tell the kindergarten teacher about Gigi. No, but don't tell anybody about Gigi. Don't tell anybody that you hear voices either, because I started hearing voices when I was three, when I was two or three. And my mom, who was born with the ability to hear voices as well, said, you don't tell anyone and it's in the book. You don't tell anyone, you put that in the closet where you would put incest and murder. You never talk about it, ever, to anyone. And so I did, I put it into that closet deep in the basement and I locked the door and I never used it. I never used it at all, ever, until I became so sick I was dying and my guides blew that door off and came rushing to the surface. And I believe we are all born with that intuition and we're taught not to use it. It's not socially acceptable. It means you're crazy. No, it's not. No, it doesn't. It gives you an edge over the rest of them who are still in denial. When they look at you and say, how did you know that? My dreams told me, yeah, right, watch them scream, running from the door. Or they're going to understand you. But there's a big shift in the universal consciousness that's going on. Dreams are coming to the forefront. Did any of you see um, on TV Proof, the series yeah. Proof? Yeah. Wasn't that fantastic? I was jumping up and down during that show every <laughs> single time it came on. Proof is a doctor who has been hired by this multi-billionaire to find life after death because he's dying of a uh, cancer. She doesn't believe in God. She doesn't believe in anything. And it's not until you're halfway through that you realize why she has agreed to do this. And I'm not going to give it away because I want you guys no. to look it up. But there is such a, um, there's such a shift into dreams and life beyond life and that's what this is all about this guy wants her to prove it and by trying to disprove it she proves it to herself which is interesting i said to my husband I turned to my husband i grabbed him and somebody hear that whenever the doctors would say to me that's not no that's not you, you can't you, there's no we can't do that we can't do that cat we just can't i'd say prove me wrong 
go, we can't do that. Prove me wrong. Fine, I'll believe you. Just prove me wrong. Because so far, I have proved that everything I've said has been right. You've used your test to prove that I was right. Prove me wrong. And when they would try to prove me wrong, they'd prove I was right and that they were wrong. So throughout this, this series of proof, she would say, prove me wrong. Or the, the guy would say, prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. And she would go out there to try and prove him wrong. And it would prove that he was right. And it was just completely changing her, her belief system. And that's what's happening throughout the world. There's this big change in belief systems that's going on. We're getting back to the basics. Freud believed in this. Freud used this. You know, you talk, President Lincoln, he saw his death. He didn't believe what he was dreaming. He didn't know how to decipher it. He saw himself in the coffin. He talked to the soldier standing next to his coffin saying, who's in there? And the soldier in the dream said, a president. Imagine if he had delved into that dream deeper, remembered more of that dream. And that begs the question, could he have changed history? I changed mine. I'm not dead. I'm here speaking to you now and telling you, you have the capacity to do everything I just did. I'm not special. Oh, I'd love to say that I was. I'd love to become a guru, make billions of dollars, but I'm not. You can do everything I did. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the third time you got cancer, did they believe you? No. No, oh. they didn't. No. They told me that they would not do a double mastectomy because my right breast was healthy. There was no cancer in it. And they did an MRI and they said, see, here's the MRIs. But my guide said, it's there, it's just not showing up. And so I said, I want a double mastectomy. And I had to go to New York to get it. The Boston doctors wouldn't do it. And what do so, they care? What do they care? I don't know. They, they're not real flexible. The, the doctors in California are very flexible. It's a matter of the way they think. Boston doctors are extremely conservative. They only do what the hospital tells them they can do and say and believe, with, even if they believe differently. I actually you know, said to my oncologist, the chief of oncology, you want me to take this second chemo when you know the side effects are really bad. And I've already been through chemotherapy twice. I've already done radiation therapy twice. Am I taking years off the end of my life for overkill in the front part? Can you tell me that this is really good for me? And he just looked at me sheepishly and he said, I did take an oath. I can do no harm. You don't want me to take this. But it took all of that to get him to say that. And that's after I had already gone to New York. And so in New York, the doctors agreed to do it. First of all, the doctors in New York weren't sure about me because the doctors in Boston, I was very upfront with everything. And I said, I'm going to New York to get this done. And, and they said, well, we want the names of your doctors. Fine. These doctors were all the doctors that worked on Jackie Kennedy. The reason I got them is because one of my really close girlfriends is um, it works at um, Sloan Kettering, and she's the chief of um, bases. I can't remember what all that. Ba basically, it's chief of plastic surgery for anybody who has double mastectomies or anything else. And she put this team together when I called her up in tears because the doctors just weren't listening to me anymore and I was tired of fighting with them, I was exhausted. And you know, when you're going through chemotherapy, you're cranky anyhow, you know? So the doctors that she got put together for me were the chiefs of everything at a Sloan Kettering and University of New York Medical. They were every bit as impressive as the doctors I had in Boston. So when I sent over that list of doctors, my doctors in Boston said, God, we don't want them working on her and finding out that we might have made a mistake. It was too late. So they called them and they said, you know, she's crazy. She's crazy and you need to have a psychological done on her before you 
do surgery on her because she's not stable. <clears throat> so at the 11th hour, the day before my surgery, I get a call from the doctor that's going to do the double mastectomy. And he says, Kathy, we can't do the surgery. We can only take off the one breast that we know had cancer in it and take off the other breast. I said, if I wanted that, I would have just stayed in Boston. I said, yeah, but before we even do the other surgery, we need to have a psychological on you. I said, fine. Get the therapist. Get the psychiatrist. Get them all. Put them in a room. When I'm done with them, they're going to say, if I don't have this done, I should be committed. So the doctors talked to me for about five minutes and said, do the double mastectomy. And this girl knows what she's talking about. And you can tell it from the record. So they did. When they sent the breast off to pathology, it had lobular cancer in it. See, the second cancer was lobular, liquid. It doesn't show up in anything. Mm -hmm. That's what Elizabeth Edwards had. And so when they sent that breast off the pathology, it showed up. Now, when I said to my doctors in Boston, when they said, why do you want to both off? I said, lobular cancer has a tendency to mirror itself in the other breast. Hence, cancer land through the looking glass. They said, that's an old wives' tale. That's not true. They've disproved that. My double mastectomy proved them wrong. It does do that regularly. And it doesn't always show up in an MRI because it's liquid. So the thing is, that sounds like a really, you know, it sounds like I'm like one in a million, right? There's, there's not that many people. No. <laughs> not that many people that do that. If there are 20 women, 20 women who came forward to be researched by this doctor, there are 20,000, 60,000, 100,000 who have not come forward. So we're daring to be at the front of that arrow and saying, come on, it's okay to tell people you drink. It's okay to stand in your power and speak your truth. Don't ever let someone say to you, you can't have a test. You already paid for it with your insurance. It's paid for. And what I finally said to one of the doctors who dropped me immediately, surprise, surprise, he was giving me so much trouble and saying, no, no, we're, we're gonna, and I remember I, I said, I don't wanna do it that way. I wanna do it, I wanna do it this way. And he said, that's the way I do it. That's the way it's going to be done. And I looked at him and I said, I pay you, you work for me. Well, he dropped me, but that's okay because I got a better doctor. Doctors come down. <laughs>